This is an Inside Jerry's Brain Call on Tuesday, April 2nd, uh, 2019, the day after April Fool's Day. So everything we say today has to be factual. Yesterday was the day of, of skepticism on the internet, which is rare because mostly everybody buys everything that gets said. Um, so here we are. And I was just saying that next week I'm going to be, uh, April and I are going to be at a conference called the Conference on World Affairs in Boulder, uh, hosted by the CU Boulder, Colorado University Bo at Boulder. And um, it's all volunteer, nobody pays the speakers, uh, and you, you get put on a lot of things, some of which are in your sweet spot and some of which are not. And everybody knows, okay, good, you know, you're not an expert in this thing, but we just want to hear what you have to say. So April and I are each on, a, are each on about eight panels, uh, plus a couple other, other events. And um, before going, once we were accepted as speakers, we were asked, what topics would you like to talk about? And on those topics, I put on there uh, something like today's topic for this call. And it turns out that there are, I'm on a couple of panels. Of my eight, uh, two of them are about uh, gender and women's issues and, and things like that. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. So in, in some sense, uh, this call is a little bit of, of prep and just turning the soil for me for, for what, what should I say next week. And then, uh, Judy, as you just said, I think maybe there's a, a really good opportunity to, to sort of have a, a, a revisit the topic afterward and see what came out of it and what we've all thought about in between and, and so forth. So um, I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Is it a relatively stable group of participants in this conference over the years or how do people find out about it and attend? So it's, um, it's sort of rare to be re-invited a lot. Um, so we're very happy, we, you know, they like us, we get high ratings, et cetera. So they've invited us back and we're a twofer because, you know, we, we've roomed together, come together. Uh, the way we even know about it and got into it is that we have dear friends who live in Boulder. Uh, the woman in the couple is part of the organizing committee for CWA <laughs> and she proposed us. Uh, and so three years ago they said yes. Uh, and that was our first year doing it. So we stayed with this couple while we're in Boulder, which is fantastic because we get quality time with them. Uh, we get to be in Boulder in the spring, and we get to you know mix and mingle with all these people. But the the crowd of speakers, the hundred speakers they invite, shifts around considerably year to year. And th there's a couple people. There's a fellow who used to be the chief creative director for Cirque du Soleil. He gets invited back almost every year. Uh, they have a jazz festival. Morning, Ken. Uh, they have a bunch of other things that are kind of repeat events. Uh, one night is a big you know jazz. Uh, performance in the auditorium, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they used to have Molly Ivins show up regularly until she passed. So now they sort of honor her, but she was a, a regular at this event uh, and added a, a, touch of, a touch of humor and sort of cynical observation of the world uh, during it. So it's pretty interesting. Great. Um, cool. And, and they have a free app. And they have an app, so you can see all the speakers and all the stuff. And I was just, you know, looking through all the all the different sessions, and you can see bios of all the speakers and what other panels each of the speakers is on, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, last year, they poured the data into the app like an hour before the whole event started. Uh, this this year, it's all set and ready to go now. So if you install the CWA app, which is free, you can sort of see what's going on and, and track it. I don't think they live stream very much. They do publish some of the videos later. Um, but they haven't really published any of the sessions that April and I have been on. So that's one of, one of the things I want to make sure somehow happens is that they, because uh, April was on a, a panel about grief last year that was really phenomenal. Uh, and I was on a panel about storytelling uh, that was phenomenal, where I made a, a friend who is um, uh, an Irish storyteller with a beautiful accent who really, who goes around the world telling stories. Um, and in a, in a very, very beautiful way, stories taken from many deep cultures. So um, part of what uh, Jean was saying and as we were just hanging out waiting for everybody to show up was, um, and, and I think this is interesting in terms of the topic we're heading into, is that you know, how much of this is data and how much of this is story, uh, what do we do? But uh, let, me, let, me frame, let me take five minutes to frame uh, Me Too as a men's problem, is, uh, is men's problem so that we can kind of dive in. Thanks. Um, I find it tragically ironic that one of the world's most notorious bullies and misogynists is currently president of the United States. I, 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 it, it blew my mind as it happened. Uh, I think that the two-year cycle of the election process 
broke a lot of things, certainly broke a lot of norms uh, in this country, which then trickled across the rest of the world for what can be said in public, what is acceptable behavior, what things you can get by with, get away with, whatever. Um, it also, in interesting ways, cracked open, I think, helped crack open the conversation about Me Too and others, other kinds of things. I think that, that in some sense it broke enough things that through those cracks, energy that had been suppressed uh, was making its way through as well. And you, you may, you may uh, and I don't know that I feel strongly about that, that particular narrative uh, about Me Too, because Me Too is, uh, every now and then these, these things sort of surge anyway. These are, um, we're sort of living with a series of, of, of wounds or traumas that until we actually deal with them properly, keep bubbling up over and over again. And equality of all people is sort of a, a big umbrella for some of those wounds. We have their uh, racism and slavery. We have their, uh, you know, the, the disaster, humanitarian disaster of what happened to Native, Amer Native uh, American peoples and indigenous tribes around the world, et cetera, et cetera. And the more we ignore these things, the more they fester. And then now and then that pot bubbles over, so to speak. So, um, so I'm going to this conference and I have a couple panels that are about women's issues. So in some sense, uh, I, I thought of this topic partly as prep for it. I was also struck um, by the Kavanaugh hearing and I posted, I'll, I'll put the post uh, here, um, but I, I, I wrote a post um, during the Kavanaugh hearing, it was like right after the day of, of testimonies, um, in which I, I basically said, gosh, I, you know, after hearing uh, Blassie Ford's testimony in the morning, I was like, wow. And then the moment Kavanaugh started, my first thought was, well, okay, I guess he's given up on ever getting this nomination and get, be, being on the Supreme Court, he's just going to rant. And I, I, I mistook, I, I didn't realize that some people saw his anger as righteous indignation for having his name besmirched and that that was just fine. Um, there was also another agenda behind the scenes, which was there were a whole bunch of people desperate to get him on the court to balance politics and so on and so forth. And they were willing to overlook pretty much anything and run over anybody. So that's a, a separate agenda. But I think that the Kavanaugh hearing really put a lot of this in front of us because uh, the testimony was so vivid and a lot of this was really coming out. Um, I, will, I will add th that uh, one of my beliefs is that violence against women and girls is epidemic and way underreported and is a real problem everywhere. It's also institutionalized and systemic. Um, and one of the problems, of course, is that when you report things, it's a career limiting move. Uh, so that's, you know, that, that's, a, that's not a good thing. Uh, there's a, there's a, a group called Gender Avengers uh, started by uh, Gina... Uh, oh heck, what's her last name? I'll, I'll get it in just a second. Gina Glantz, uh, who used to be at SEIU. She was basically Andy Stern's uh, lieutenant at SEIU, retired out of SEIU. And then her original thought with Gender Avengers was, <clears throat> what if there was a network of ladies of a certain age who don't have any career threat over them, if they speak up, who would be available to help defend, protect, represent, back up, younger women who were facing these kinds of issues. That was the original idea behind Gender Adventure. What it turned into was an organization focused on gender balance at conferences. So the, the thing they've done a reasonable <laughs> job of is, is creating like a hall of fame and a hall of shame for conferences. And there's an app in the app store you can install on your phone where you can look at the conference schedule for any conference you attend, count the number of men and women, type it in, submit it, and then the ones that are well balanced get, go into the hall of fame, the ones that are terrible get shamed in some sense, which is, which is great. But, but I loved Gina's original, original goal for the network. Like how do we back people who need the backing? But then again, and this comes back to the topic, the wording of the topic for this call, like why should women be defending, what, what, like men are the problem. Like why is this up to women to create a network to defend, women, et cetera, et cetera. Like much as I liked Gina's, Gina's thing, it's like, no, 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 there's, there's another problem a deeper, bigger problem going on here. Um, and then I'll say just, I grew up, um, I grew up as an expat uh, child of an American executive in Peru and Argentina. Um, and my, my, my dad was really interesting. Um, he was a man's man without ever being a macho man, which is really interesting meaning he taught me how to shoot, and he used to load his own ammo, taught me how to shoot weapons and gun safety, taught me carpentry. We built a little model of a, 
of a catch he wanted to own but never got to own, uh, a whole bunch of like manly man sort of things, and never boys don't cry, uh, and nothing, to, nothing bad about women ever, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, none of that, um, which was, I, I find, sort of weirdly unusual. And despite that, and through my experiences with boys and men in the world, I grew up ashamed of men. I grew up, I grew up not really liking men very much, uh, making better friends with, with girls and women. Um, and I grew up uh, never wanting to like drink heavily to get drunk and go you know, join a frat and do whatever. Like that whole lifestyle just repelled me. Um, and, and I found it interesting. I just sort of absorbed that somehow and, and kept going. I will pause because Judy has raised her hand, please. Well, I wanted to run in a couple of ways. I could certainly go on at length as a person who's now out of the system. Judy, I don't know if it's me or you guys, or you, but your connection is uh, breaking up. And impact. Shoot. Judy, my apologies. Probably your voice is my coming. Connections under yeah. the table. I've closed all the other windows. Okay, your, your image is frozen and your voice is coming in and out, so I'm afraid I'm going to ask you to restart your comments. But if you'll start again and speak slowly, we'll probably hear you. Hey, John, welcome to the call. I'll try again. I was going to say that one of the most impactful things I've seen recently is some major scientific societies actively stepping into the ring, publishing policies about appropriate behaviors of all types, not only about women, but all diversity, um, holding seminars at scientific meetings about that. It was kind of led by the American Society of Geology and AIP, which is physics, picked up on it. ACS has picked on it. Now they're starting to be international discussions about international codes of behavior and processes to address. And societies, some of them are excluding people from membership if the investigation verifies the inappropriate behavior at national meeting, for instance. Um, the panel discussions that have been held have included men and women, and these have been packed rooms with a lot of uh, occasionally not gen mostly genuine questions from men about how you appropriately. Um, you know, it's like somebody will say, well, you know, isn't it okay to say one looks nice, <laughs> you know, and it depends on how that's received. And so women in the audience and panelists responded with suggestions of appropriate to approach the topic to be clear. Uh, examples being, don't say you look nice, say blue is a great color for you. It, it's a different kind of comment. Or is it all right if I comment on how nice you look or something of that order? So I think they're examples. Um, but I think looking at some of those larger institutions might offer good suggestions for people to explore. Love that. Thank you, Judy. Um, anybody else with, with uh, comments around codes of conduct and, and things like that? I'd just say um, I've noticed in the last couple of years, there's a very interesting phenomenon around age. So a lot of the older men in my life are kind of like, oh, me too. Soon you won't be able to say, you know, just what Judy said, you're going to be able to say, give a woman a compliment. Uh, it's going to be seen as sexual harassment. And younger men seem to have a much different uh, take on that, that they understand the difference between a compliment and harassment. Um, so it's very intriguing to me. What is it about this gender um, uh, thing that is so different among the older generation? Um, maybe it's the way that we were brought up and inherited things from our parents, particularly our fathers. Um, but I have noticed that among younger men in my life, there is a much finer shade of gradation around what constitutes harassment versus what constitutes a compliment. That's very interesting. Joe Biden is facing a little thunderstorm <clears throat> around that this very moment, right? It's, uh, he's kind of a touchy-feely sort of guy, uh, very huggy, and it's, it's like not working at all. I, I don't like his policies, but whatever. But, but he's, he's currently being sort of drawn and quartered for, uh, for being a little too intimate um, with people. It's very, it's very interesting. I, mean, I think there's an interesting conversation to be had um, here about 
what is, what is the line, where do we draw the lines and what is the line? And in particular, a thing that, that I, I, I don't know how to talk about is we're in a society where this kind of a vigilante mode with, you know, off with his head or her head is the response to a lot of things. Uh, when, some, when somebody goofs somewhere, like were they fired, was their career destroyed, were they sent out to the wilderness, as opposed to could we sit down and have a conversation about what broke, make sure it doesn't break again, learn from it, and did this person learn? In which case, maybe they can go back in and you know, keep doing stuff. But I, but I think that the more the stakes go up on these incidents bubbling over, the less people are going to be forthcoming about trying to be helpful, the less the conversation is going to happen uh, about, about all these kinds of things. You know, once, once execution is the, the way these things are handled, um, nobody's going to volunteer to step up and say, hey, I did X or hey, I did Y. Uh, Doug, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, this is a very difficult conversation. Uh, having to do with human nature and what we want to be as a species and how we want to live with each other. I find it very unsatisfying uh, because the tendency in the current situation is for people just to withdraw from each other, mm -hmm. which doesn't seem to me good. Uh, I grew up in New York City in a fairly uh, kind of uh, Protestant severe culture. Then I lived in Mexico for a few years and learned to be totally different. In Mexico, you learn to touch everybody. Uh, it just is what you do. It's the way things are. And I've learned it well enough that I know back in the States, I can touch people all the time. I'm not aware of it. And I've never had a negative reaction to it. People just accept that it's in the context of being friendly and being supportive. Um, the issues of, of what teenage sexuality should be like. Uh, I've got uh, uh, some teenage grandchildren uh, and they seem to be fine with what's happening, but I think they're much more detached from each other and sexuality than my generation was. All of which is to say, you know, I. I, I don't have a position about this, except it's a really difficult conversation and mm -hmm. worth having. Yeah, thanks, Doug. And, and I'd like to, I, 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 want to, I want to sort of gently take us toward what should we actively do, and we, meaning men in particular, uh, we as a society as well, but, but we meaning men. Ken, go ahead. Thanks, Doug, for <clears throat> bringing up culture. Um, I was in France two years ago working with a mining company, which uh, in honor of International Women's Day, they wanted to do uh, uh, some work around women and inclusion. And um, we developed a process using a lot of post-its of asking people different questions about their perception as well as their reality. And it had to do with men's advantages in the workplace and women's disadvantages. And it was very lopsided. You know, the men had all the advantages, women had almost no advantages, and men had very few disadvantages, women had huge disadvantages. And there was never in either France or Belgium when we did this work, anybody mentioned anything about uh, what we would call harassment here. And I pointed that out and they said, Ken, you're in France. We can do stuff here that would land you in jail in the United States. You know, it's very different in France and, and Belgium in terms of how they uh, hold sexuality and, and, and women in terms of interaction between men and women than it is here in the US there, or Canada or Asia is very different as well. So it's a very messy, messy thing. And I think, you know, my experience, uh, I'll try to extrapolate from my experience of work with groups to a larger scale of it comes down to setting norms, you know, in the, it, when we have unconscious assumptions bumping up against each other and creating that kind of um, huge reactivity, that's the time to say, well, what actually is okay? What, and what works for you? And how can we make this work for everybody? And what is okay and what's off limits? And then let's get agreement about that and have permission to be clumsy because for some people it'll be a new learning. And so they're, they're not gonna get it immediately. So give them the grace to say, I'm trying, you know, rather than you screwed up and off with your head. Cause that whole thing as Jerry points out just leads to total breakdown. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really displeased with the off with their head culture. I think that, and, and this goes way beyond me too issues. This goes, you know, to 
the Boeing 737 MAX problem and whether, who, you know, who is to blame for two airplanes just going down in good weather because there might have been a software plus a policy glitch. Like, there, there, there's going to be a hunt for, for the guilty and, and there's, the conversation is stifled because it's a hunt for the guilty and we know what happens to those guilty. Although, gotta say, um, it's a lot different from back in the days when the king would actually say. I mean, we're using off with his head metaphorically here. Uh, back in the day, it was actually not such a metaphor. It, it occurs to me kind of the, the compliment to your design from trust conversations is restorative versus punitive justice. You know, yes. on, the, on the flip side of that is when people do make mistakes, when there are severe consequences, do we look for learning and, and you know, holding people accountable and giving them the, the opportunity to, to make some kind of reconciliation move? Or do we just punish them as, as harshly as possible? Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it. There's a night in day which details uh, the um, uh, evolution of um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. It's really a fascinating documentary. Uh, does it look like this one? Well, yes, it does. And that's, yeah, it's 20 years ago. Okay. I uh, thought it was a little more recent, but yes. <laughs> and, and I'm a huge fan of Truth and Reconciliation. In fact, one of my ideas is to create a norm or a practice, or even an institution don't know, where corporations could invoke TNR commissions around something they've done as a way of clearing the skeletons in their closet. So here's, here's, here's that idea. What if we use TNR for relations between communities and companies, right? So this would be a way for a company to say, hey, we've been doing X and we know it's not good, We'd like to not lose the company and be driven bankrupt and be put in jail for it, but we'd like to make amends and fix it and do whatever. How do we go about doing that? And I don't, there, there, is no, there is no thing like that, right? What you get is the VW Dieselgate problem where it just gets buried and then everybody has to kind of go with it until it shows up and, and spills into public view. Or PG&E. Let's start with PG&E, you know? Or yeah. Purdue. Um, so I've got a thought for scandals. I've got uh, presidential scandals, sex scandals, business scandals, financial scandals, political scandals. So here's businesses behaving very badly, uh, overprotecting IP is its own category, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and, and this idea of skeletons in the closet, which I, I should connect. Uh, I should connect to what if we had TNR commissions, there we go. And from this earlier, when I said we had some buried trauma, um, <clears throat> I, I kind of think about that as ghost, ghosts in our past that we haven't dealt with. So uh, there's a really nice, and I, I'm borrowing this from a, a, an interesting book titled Ghosts of Spain, uh, that's about Spain, which basically when Franco died and Juan Carlos took over and reinstated the, the regular democracy, um, the quid pro quo was basically everybody was quiet. There was, the, they were, nobody was to speak about what happened. Nobody was to look into it until years later, they started finding mass graves. And then it really started bubbling over. Anyway, um, back to our regularly scheduled program, which is about like, what should men do? And one, one thing that I think is really interesting um, as, a, as a thing to do is being a good ally. And this comes, I think, more out of race relations than gender relations, but I think it applies everywhere. <clears throat> and there's a, a bunch of things about being a good ally, but you know, learning to be a good ally, I think is a, an important thing uh, to do. Here's a, the Selfish Activist Guide to Allyship. Uh, here's another guide to allyship. I've got you know, some of these resources I can, I can share with us, but I think that's, a, that's one kind of answer. Uh, I'm interested in what else, what else uh, comes to mind for everybody. One of the things that strikes me about this conversation is the polarity between men and women, which is a very low level of diversity since men come in all sorts of stripes and women come in all sorts of spots. Uh, why are we doing that? Uh, isn't the, the social issue that the normal boundaries that we grew up with as children are breaking down and we're getting a porosity uh, between identities, among identities? Uh, which creates its own problem because people don't quite know what to do and who they are. Right. And that's where I think the issue is, is, is that the, 
the old uh, frozen identity of masculine and feminine hardly exists anymore. That's really interesting because gender, gender has become <clears throat> uh, a big issue. Identity politics is the weaponization of these issues, uh, you know, for politics, for political purposes. Um, but there is a lot, a lot broader grayscale or a lot broader spectrum of gender identity than there used to be, um, at least in the public conversation. So I, I, I agree. So another thing I'm going to throw in here is the idea of identity politics has been seen by some as a marketing opportunity for corporations with identity products, especially clothes. Uh, and it's a distraction from the key issues of our time, which have to do with the breakdown of governance, uh, automation, and climate change. And so we're all going around doing identity politics and destroying each other. Uh, Gene has raised his hand. Go ahead. Tengi said one of our greatest learning disabilities is our belief that the problem is out there. And Covey said that true proactivity begins when we realize the extent to which we are part of the problem. So as a, rather than, you know, looking outward and talking about all these other things that are the problem, begin with self and say, how is it that I am contributing to the problem and not contributing to the solution? Um, thank you. Do, you. do you wanna add any stories or context to that just for, for us here? I mean, I, 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 <clears throat> I get that. And, and I, I think that a lot of the willingness to talk about these issues comes from people who don't see themselves as propagating these things very much, but probably are in different ways. So I, 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 I wanna be aware of that. Um, but I'm interested in where, where you would take this. Well, when we look in the mirror, we see what we wanna see, okay? We, we believe our, about ourselves what, what we want to believe. And, and if you really care about understanding the extent to which you may be part of the problem, you need, you need a true mirror, which is the people around you. you. You have to be able to ask questions to find out the things that you can't see. Right? I, <clears throat> I once found myself responsible for a group of about 50 people who were proposal writers and editors and graphics designers. And and there were things going on in the organization that, that I needed to understand, and they wouldn't tell me. So one day, being relatively courageous, I got the group managers in a conference room and said, okay, I would like you to make a list. I want you to do a SWOT analysis of me. The things I'm doing that contribute, the things that I'm doing that get in the way, the things that uh, I need to do better than I need to stop doing, and I'm leaving. When I come back, the only, I will not argue with any of the comments. I will not seek to understand whose comments they are. I will only ask questions to help me understand if there are aspects of it that I don't realize. Probably the longest 30 minutes of my life, being gone, wondering what the hell are they saying? They didn't believe me. And the feedback that I got was relatively reserved. But there were some things that that I could understand about the organization and things that were happening between people. And I posted the results on the wall outside. Well, I didn't have an office. I had a desk in the middle of the floor. And I posted it on the wall and I said, I will work on this. And I actively worked on it so that they understood that I was working on it. And three months later, when we did it again, the feedback was much more honest. Uh, getting to a point where it was almost brutal, though it was a way to, to actually have these people better understand each other by focusing on me 
and me to understand things that I could never get them to tell me directly because it, they felt it wasn't safe. And to date, of the hundreds of people that I have described this to, I've only found one with the courage to do it in an organization. There's just too much fear of what people might say about them. So in terms of using that approach to find out things that you might be contributing to the problem is an approach that I have repeatedly used and it's just marvelous. And I, <clears throat> I really analogy. Um, even though I think that often the people closest to us are often <clears throat> they're often bought into our identity or we have too long-term a relationship with them that hasn't been dealt with or whatever. So I'm, I'm wondering how that might break. And I have a feeling my connection is not very good right now. Yeah, you uh, Judy, glitched a couple times. Judy, yeah, my apologies. Judy, you had raised your hand? Uh, yes. I think that one of the most impact things that I've observed is when a man in a quiet, calm voice speaks up in an uncomfortable situation. Um, and it may just be I'm not comfortable with the behavior that I'm seeing in this room today. Um, and someone will explore that and it will lead to a calm discussion because it was broached fairly neutral and it was broached with ownership by the individual. So I think if we're talking about this individual and their opportunity to influence culture, um, private and public conversations in a respectful exploratory way and viewing with a different perspective can be really, really constructive, much more so than a woman because it's automatically puts the person where in a defensive position unless you've become very skilled at delivering 40 or 50 years on that at it. So that's something women could do is teach other women how to address the situation as well. But one of the things that I observed recently, and it was in and around the hearings that I think I might have mentioned even in an early call, call there was, there were a, a room in the hearings, the men just couldn't believe that this was happening, there was no man to know. He had been brought to that no man, so he trusted the reporting. And women in the room explained a different reality to him, which then led a gay man in the group to explain his assault and the difficulty of doing it at the time. So it can be very humanizing and powerful if people can speak authentically, individually about something. Uh, Judy, your voice was clipping in and out a little bit more toward the beginning. So maybe next time you speak up, if you'll mute your video while you speak, that'll probably give you enough bandwidth that we hear all of your audio and then you can come back on video. But I think we got uh, much of what you said. Um, I, I also wanted to, <clears throat> this is, um, you know, there was this article about how Inuit parents raise their kids without yelling and teach them to control anger. <clears throat> And one of the principles of Inuit child rearing is don't ever shout or yell at small children. So what they do instead is they talk about the episode later and they, they use kind of dramas uh, to, to describe better behavior. But what's, what's interesting is that the Inuit see losing your temper as a major, major bad thing to do. That self-control is important and you never do anything in anger. And I think that's a, 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 an interesting and profound thing to be that deep in a culture, right? Um, that their form of discipline is actually storytelling. They tell stories and they have the kid, they'll have the kids do something uh, that has some sort of uh, repercussions. And they'll say, well, wh why are you doing that? Do you want to do more of it? How do I feel about it? They'll talk through it in that way, but calmly. So I think, I think calm and safety are really important here. And we're in a society at a moment where there's very little of either. Um, 
John, any thoughts? Do you want to just whatever's whatever's on your mind from uh, from where we are? Um, it's this is a very difficult subject because not only is it uh, you need to make sense, you need to have a lot of understanding and experience. Um, and also for somebody like me who was born in the 60s, brought up in the 70s, it is a kind of a minefield. By meaning well, you can kind of say the wrong thing while you're trying to navigate. But I want to come back just to help me understand, we've got a group of people here today, is that your point, Jerry, where you say, what as we men can do about this? Well, the bit that what I struggle with at the moment is it's human nature is on a continuum and we have bad people at one end and say good people at the other, whatever label you want to attach to that. I'm going to keep it simple, bad and good or with intentions. And it's the same with sexuality. There are men who are predators, no matter what you say or how you try and change their behavior. It's as if the brain is wired that way. I'm not going to use the word brain damage or mentally ill for the sake of this argument, but they are different. And it's, many times it's nothing to do with their upbringing or life chances or their education or a stable family or a lack of a family or childhood abuse or trauma. It's just in that instance, they are predators. And then if you start to move further up that scale, you enter the realms of horror films, of nightmare, of men that not only abuse children, they will inflict pain and harm them and murder them for sexual gratification. Nobody can understand why that is. Now, I, I would regard that as mental illness. So the next thing is to say, well, what do we do in a society is we put those people into a prison and try and rehabilitate them. But if, if a man is inclined to do that to children, when they, I mean, let's forget the sadistic paedophile. There are men who will say, well, I just love children. And you try and understand, well, but you do that, but you don't have sex with them. That's different. Um, and that's how I see this argument is to say, well, imagine trying to have a conversation with that person, a person which you can't really bear to look at because of what they've done. And then a man who is a, just a, say, a, see, this is where it gets difficult, well, a low level predator. See, it's, you know, they're, they're all predators. You know, it's either you either have good manners, you are polite or you're not. It's having, how do you have that conversation when, in my opinion, to date, I feel that you can't change somebody, change somebody or rehabilitate them when they are of that disposition. This brings to mind for me the idea of the bell curve that there's on either end of the spectrum, there's people who are not going to budge from their position for whatever reason, whether it's uh, the way they've been conditioned, brain damage, mental illness. But there's also the vast middle, which is where we have to have the conversation to set the norms. And, um, and oftentimes, people in the middle who demonize those folks at the end, you know, you have to watch out, there are really bad people. And we have to protect ourselves against them, gain an inordinate amount of power through the use of fear tactics. Um, you know, there's this great quote from Solzhenitsyn that I've, I've often used in the bottom of my emails in the past of, if only it were so simple, if only there were evil men doing, evil people off somewhere doing evil deeds and all that was necessary was to separate them from the rest of us. But the line between good and evil runs through everyone's heart and who among us is willing to cut off a piece of our heart. So, you know, how do we maintain compassion for the people who are never going to fit into a, a, a social mold where we would want them to be around children or women or anybody because they're, they're dangerous um, and not act towards them punitively and not allow the fear of them to color our 
relationships with the rest of, of humanity, the people that we, we love and care for, that we want to, you know, be in good relationship with and create ways to be in good relationship with. It's very naughty, very messy. There's lots of interacting things that are hard to see and, and have kind of delays and stuff. So it's, um, but, but I come back to, you know, I think having the conversation is really important. Um, you know, Gene, I really appreciate your, your point earlier about working within. So in my case, it was getting married that really woke me up to a lot of my bad behaviors. I have a strong wife who said, Hey, you don't get to do that. You know? And, um, man, I learned the first 10 years of being together with this woman taught me so much about my shortcomings and my, my conditionings and how I would often put her down to make me feel bigger, you know, and that was really not okay, but it was an adaptive strategy from my youth that had to be gotten rid of. And, you know, she's like, I'm here, I'm not going anywhere, but you can't do that shit anymore, right? So, um, and, and we can't marry everybody off, but, but boy, I think there's a lot to be said for that, of having someone in your life who loves you and cares about you and says, this is very immature. This is something that does not, will not stand. We can't keep doing this and you need to find a different way. And, you know, in the presence of that, you can see great flowering, you know, and in the absence of that, you can see great withering. So, you know, how do we create those kinds of, of relationships among people where it's, um, uh, it doesn't have to be your, your romantic partner or, or spouse, but that kind of community where, where men can go, all right, I'm going to walk into a lion's den filled with women and be by myself for a little while and give them permission to give me feedback without getting defensive. Um, be an interesting social experiment. Mm -hmm. I think, I think what we're talking about right now would be a good Aikido practice. Basically, you know, how, how do, how do we get better at improving the things around us? Part of this is listening to others and helping each other let go of things we're doing that don't really actually work. Um, a, a bit back to what John was saying, my, my own belief system is that trauma is actually pervasive and institutionalized throughout society and that most, most, things, most of us are, are sort of carrying some sort of trauma because the system has, in, has incorporated and absorbed a lot of automatic ways of inflicting trauma on us. But I also believe that a bunch of evil is convertible. I think that, uh, John, I think that, that people are on that spectrum of good and evil almost at a moment's notice and that some people ha have these things so burned into their neural paths that they're, they're effectively sociopaths. And I'm unsure of how you reach them or whether you can reach them. So I get that. But I think that for a whole lot of people, the things that they do that are provocations, that are insults, that are attacks, are often, are often cries for help, are often, and, and here we get into sort of cliche territory of, of, you know, of how trauma is being seen sometimes in society. But I think that many people are, are sort of switchable to a different path. And I'll, I'll share here a documentary I watched on Netflix recently called White Right, Meeting the Enemy, where Dia Khan, who uh, was basically, uh, she's um, Pakistani who, uh, it, Pakistan basically didn't work for her and, and she, was, she was having to leave the country, went, tried to go to New York and do what she was doing before. <clears throat> that didn't really work. And then um, she ends up doing this documentary where she, uh, a woman of color with a camera and I think maybe one sound man, maybe not, goes into um, places where alt-right people are, you know, at a shooting range, basically, you know, practicing their weapons for when the, when the military come to take their weapons away or whatever, and makes friends with a lot of them uh, to the point where later in the documentary, uh, the one guy who's like the spokesman for this white nationalist movement is like, well, no, like you're, you're my friend. And she's like, but, but people like me should leave the country. Right. And he's like, he's like, yes. And she says, does that include me? And he's like, well, yes, but you're different. Uh, but you, you can actually see the people she's talking to with great empathy, but really poking. I mean, she's asking very hard questions. You can see them wrestling with the questions and softening. <clears throat> so, so this documentary gave me hope that there's actually ways to um, shift people in where they are. And that a lot of the, the positions we've gotten into in society are largely because of um, things we haven't actually dealt with. That, that dealing with some of these issues might reduce the number of people who feel isolated, hated, 
victimized, whatever, whatever. So for me, the answer often is uh, compassion and reaching out and connecting with others and listening to them. Um, and, and first listening hard and then offering alternate paths that make more sense. Doug, go ahead. Yeah, I'm struck by the possible hidden assumption in the conversation that strong action is bad and calm is good. Is that the model for the future for humanity we want? Could we live with it? Uh, what are the consequences? Um, I'm going to add that to the record. Anybody want to want to tackle that? I don't see it as an either or. Uh, I think there's times when strong action is necessary and times when calm is appropriate also. Judy, do you want to jump in? I would just say that I agree with Ken. I think require strong action, uh, not necessarily anger per se, but strong action. And others lend themselves to private conversations or thoughtful discussions. So it's kind of not black and white from my perspective. Yeah, and, and I think some interventions that are sharp by which I don't mean violent, but that are more shocking or strong, that, that I think would fall under what you might think of as a strong intervention, really work and can be very, very, um, very different. Um, sometimes, sometimes you have to be gulled into a situation. So um, one of the things I love about the old world of text adventure games and text interaction is that just plain old ASCII text masks a lot of the identity information about people that we see here because we're on video with each other. <clears throat> and, you know, two kids might be playing a, a game where they compete against each other and learn to respect each other and then realize that one is an Israeli and one is a Palestinian or whatever. But, but they build some kind of bond before they discover other aspects of self. I think that's interesting. And then the, the video that Ken put uh, here earlier, um, I think is the video where first people stand in boxes in a, in a set and the box is their external classification. Over here, the people of color, over here, the, the women, over here, the whatever, and I've forgotten what the boxes were. So but then- the People have been their whole life, the immigrants, those who grew up in the country, those who've never seen a cow, you know, and, and they're all, yeah. And, 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 and they're all kind of standing in boxes like, well, okay. And then the, person, the host starts asking questions and says, everybody who hasn't known where they were gonna get a meal on any particular day, please step forward to the wall. And people step out of all the boxes and go to the wall. People step out of every box and go to the wall and look at each other like, hmm, how about that? And, and a whole lot of sort of tough questions like that come up and, and the whole exercise is, is one of, hey, look, we have a lot more in common than we don't. And this is, this is the famous saying from Joe Cox, the minister of parliament uh, who was stabbed to death uh, a couple of years ago. I think as part of this movement that we're talking about, this sort of outrage over um, gender and, and politics and you know, who gets to do what to whom, so. You know, Jerry, there's another piece, you mentioned the word sociopath earlier, and um, anybody who's seen The Corporation, the documentary of The Corporation, you know, they take the DSM and they, they look at corporate behavior through the lens of, you know, are these sociopathic behaviors, and, and they are. So many, I'm not gonna come out and say that, that the, the C-suites of corporations are filled with sociopaths, but they're filled with people who are acting in sociopathic ways. And I think that gives permission for a lot of the behavior that we see that is unacceptable, that, that is um, antithetical to, to creating the kinds of quality relationships where people really care for each other. And instead they're objectified, they're dehumanized. Um, and so that's another layer in this, you know, um, it was very interesting to me as you started this conversation that the world's biggest bully and misogynist is president of the United States. You know, and yet Harvey Weinstein was knocked out of power. And um, the, you know, the, the list is long of guys who've been knocked down by accusations. And why does this one guy have the ability to stand up there and, and not be touched by all of this? What is going on there is a really interesting question to me. And his, the power of his office grants legitimacy to so much that is just abhorrent in my mind. Um, and, and 
how can we have conversations with people who are supportive of that in ways that help them to, to see something different? And there's this quote that I heard attributed to Gandhi, but I've never been able to find it by Googling the quote to see if it's related to Gandhi. But I love the quote. And it's, your greatest ally is the part of your opponent that knows what is right. Your greatest ally is the part of your opponent that knows what is right. And if you work from that, then when you look at someone who is an opponent, I, and Gandhi did use opponent rather than enemy, you know, because he saw opponent as opposition, as you need to move left and right together, right? And opposition works to move things forward or backwards or whatever. So um, if we look at people um, who have differing perspectives as opponents rather than enemies and ask ourselves, what's the part of them that knows what is right, that, that the part of me knows what is right, that agrees on, and how can I craft questions and evoke that from them so that it really opens things up? That's really different than coming in and trying to persuade them of the rightness of our position. And it's probably the hardest thing I know. I, I, I really struggle with this one. It's very, very challenging because I yeah. get triggered emotionally, you know, and my brain freezes. And, but every now and then I'll, I'll get a little clarity. I'll ask the right question and something will open. And it's like, wow, this is, this is quite amazing. So, you know, that's an upketo practice, I believe. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> And, and part of the strategy of nonviolent social action is to peacefully provoke the other side into doing things that are so heinous that everybody looking feels shame for them mm. and feels like this needs to stop. This is not right. But, but intentionally, you know, walking over the, the Pettus Bridge or the, the salt march to the sea that Gandhi leads or whatever, just doing things that, will, that the other side needs to not let happen but in the not letting it happen, in the violent intervention, bring shame, basically cause that part of all of us that knows what's right, I love that saying, um, to show up a bit and then make, and then do something about it. And, and I love the, the Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail where he says, look, a lot of people on my side of this are saying, hey, you're moving too fast. This is not the right time. We need to be calm. And he sort of comes back and he says, it's never the right time. We, you know, we could wait forever. We've been told to wait over and over again. It's really never the right time. Let's get this right. Uh, let's figure out how this works. Judy, the floor is yours. I just was and struck. Can you, can you mute your video as you're speaking? Right. Thanks. See if that helps. Yes. I'm struck by Ken's comment about the application of DSM-3 to an institution and having led a corporate life in a relative humane corporation, I, I'm uncomfortable with generally classifications, but I, I think the idea of applying DSM principles to all sorts of institutions would be really helpful because there's a lot of um, undesirable culture here in many institutions, especially ones of longstanding in history who are reluctant to change what they've done before. And somehow finding a way to introduce that exemption, uh, that questioning, uh, the, the best way I think to invoke change is to explore why are we doing this this way? Is there a better way to do it? And sometimes that allows a shift, but I think there's a lot of approaches, but I'd be interested to actually consider other inventions in addition to corporations whether they're um, social service delivery systems, educational systems, we could pick any number. But looking at the cultural behaviors and the enablement of um, undesirable behaviors. Mm -hmm. And Judy, I've been reading a bunch of things lately from different that came in from different for three different portals, kind of, but that had a common theme, which was that um, industrialism neoclassical economics, um, capitalism, and all of these sort of things that go together um, are sort of like a human who's had the, like the, the, the moral part of their brain just taken out and then sent out into the world to go do stuff. Um, and, and that the institutions... That was my blog post. <laughs> the, yeah, that, I, that, was that it? That was it. Yeah, exactly. That was my blog post, yeah. Cool. I'm sorry, can you repeat what you just said, Ken? Thank you. It was, uh, it was Ken. Uh, go ahead, Ken. Uh, I, based on the last uh, 
Inside Jerry's Brain call, um, I had written a blog post uh, around abundance and how much um, uh, time we spent talking about scarcity. And, and it reminded me that in a book called The General Theory of Love, and the authors um, explore the limbic system, which is what separates us from reptiles. It's you know what, what allows us to have to, to, to love each other. And um, uh, so they make a really provocative statement towards the end of the book that says, uh, corporations are essentially giant neocortexes can, uh, coupled directly to society's brainstem. There's no limbic system. So you get really exquisitely ration, rational decisions that just are there to simply make money without regard to anything else. And there is no limbic system to corporations. So you can have systems of service, but systems of care are very, very difficult to find. Um, and that's one of the things that I tied into uh, Umberto Maturana says, you know, in biology, everything changes around that which is conserved. And um, if you are conserving money, you are changing old growth forests into board feet of lumber, which then feeds, feeds, you know, the money supply, but it doesn't, it externalizes all of the ecological costs. So the world is changing as we conserve money. The world is changing into ash and dust as our money grows and gets concentrated in the hands of a few people. Thank you, Ken. And here's your, your post in my brain. You're, you're you. totally right. You were, you were the synthesist. Sherry, go back to what you were saying. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to not miss what Ken had said, and I hadn't really made note of it. Um, I, I was saying what Ken just explained better, which is that capitalism, uh, neoclassical economics, the, the systems we take for granted as the operating systems we live inside of uh, have basically are basically like a human with no moral part of their brain left intact. Uh, and you know, we'll, we'll go eat the world because they're trying to maximize wealth or they're trying to maximize some other variable uh, where biology doesn't, doesn't really do that. Um, so we're trying to figure out, I mean, there's a whole lot of people trying to figure out how do we change the narratives. The, the, um, I've had a couple of uh, design from trust and other calls around the scripts we have in our heads. I, maybe I, this is something I need to come back to. Um, but for example, I've, I've listed conservative, uh, conservative scripts, for example. <clears throat> so here's how conservatives took over the agenda. Um, the four conservative G's, gods, guns, gays, and grizzlies. Uh, there's uh, think tanks and foundations. Here we go, conservative memes, that's what I'm looking for. There we go. The liberal elites, pro-life, tax and spend, teach the controversy around uh, intelligent design, the war on Christmas, liberal bias, job creators, judicial activism, global climate change, family values, the death tax, uh, you know, academic freedom. These are all terms that, that have sort of been reinforced in the conservative uh, these are conservative messages against the left, right? This is which is part of the conservative strategy. And I've been collecting them for a while. The liberal media, welfare queens, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, ownership society, which, which, you know, got really big. All of these things kind of run against having a thriving society and a thriving commons. Uh, John, you had raised your hand. Uh, go ahead. And then Jean. So to pick up on what was mentioned before about rehabilitation um, I believe in that too I, I don't I think there's only a tiny fraction of people who are born evil uh, everybody's uh, redemption is theirs if they want it uh, we also talked about the DSM which is as far as I know is classification of mental illnesses but there's one other area I'd like to talk about which is to do with just general intelligence Again, it's a continuum or a um, normal distribution. We all fit somewhere on that uh, scale. And it can also be influenced by your upbringing, your life chances, your quality of your education. And I just wonder if um, the rest of society has a responsibility to reflect back on somebody who's trying to make sense of the world. Again, I'm talking about men. Now, if you look at if I just pick one example, just to get a response, is say some, a man, a boy between the ages of 12 and 16, is growing up, and all he sees are women reading Fifty Shades of Grey. Wherever he goes, airports, 
by the swimming pool. It's it's everywhere. Just as an, a rotten example, I know it is, but does anybody see that we all have a responsibility? Um, I think I think yes, yes, but in some sense is, is my reply, which is a lot of people are engaging in a lot of pretty stupid behavior in different ways as a result of a lot of history and a lot of tangly stuff, some of which I was just trying to point out in my brain. Um, and I think we have to be gentle with each other and find some compassion and not be not rush to judgment. Um, and what we do a lot is we use quick external signs to evaluate, categorize, pigeonhole, stereotype, uh, in other ways, you know, deal with people because that's quick, that's what we do. We're, we're categorizers. We need to deal with situations quickly um, that aren't really that helpful. And that if we, once we get to know people, we realize, oh, wait, they're like a lot deeper than we thought, or the thing we thought was a symbol or a sign of this is actually something else entirely. I don't know. But I, I, I fear, I fear that if, you know, it's funny that the book I need to finish writing is called What If We Trusted You? And at the same moment, I'm, 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 I need to write why we don't trust you. Because there are thousands of really good reasons why humans are not trustworthy. I'll go into that part of my brain in a second, but Gene's got his hand up, so I want to go to Gene as well. But, but there, there's like, my overly optimistic thesis is that despite the tremendous and fabulous reasons why we humans are really fallible and stupid, um, I think that trusting one another and figuring this out together is in fact the only way forward. That's, that's my thesis. Um, and hence design from trust, hence Apkido, hence um, our little explorations inside Jerry's brain, hence all these sorts of things. I think that trust is in fact the way forward, the linchpin. And I also think that we're living at a moment in time when trust has been shattered and most of our institutions have been designed from mistrust of the average person which means they're coercive, which means they break away the genius that shows up when you let people collaborate and find each other, which means that we have a shoot the messenger or you know, hang them you know, uh, off with his head kind of, kind of mentality, which means that many people are distracted by trivial pursuits, not the game, but the genre, um, because that's what you, you numb things out when things aren't working for you or if you had abuse or trauma in your life, or, 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 or. So all these things will cause very weird signs to show up on the surface. And to me, it's important we get under the surface somehow quickly and manage to make human connections with each other so we can work our way out of this thing. Because we're, we're, we're pretty deep down this little rat hole, and it's, it can go much further down. Like, I don't think trust is nearly as broken as it could get. Like, I think trust is very broken right now. I think it could dive way, way further. We're, we're nowhere near the bottom of it. The six of us are sitting here having a, a pretty high trust conversation. And we could be in a situation where this would be hard to find, get, or do. But like, like there's, there's a lot of room on the downside here. Uh, Gene, let me pass the baton to you. Ken's comments about organizations and money um, queued up a, I've been reading The Uninhabitable Earth. Oh, man. And there's, there's a quote in there from someone else, um, a future historian who looks back upon society after we destroyed ourselves. And the quote is, they lived for money and they died for money. We essentially perished because that was, that was the focus. Right, as opposed to the learning to make connections and and be together as as humanity, as you know, the comment about only humans can be inhumane. Um, but then the other comments that were being made about um, trust and and what it provides a basis for. I, I sent you. The video I probably posted it before, Semler's video, the the TED talk that he did. I mean, he he is absolutely a hero that I have followed for the last twenty years, because he understand he understands it, and is able to communicate it in a way 
that's that's just brilliant. Absolutely. And and I'll post it. I'll post a link to what I consider to be his his best video. Please um, do. And I'll I'll post a link to my brain here at this spot for Ricardo because I've got I've got uh, th this is I think his TEDx. That's it. Yeah, it's radical wisdom. Radical wisdom for a company, a school, a life, and these are the notes I took from the talk. So, um, okay. yeah, I, I completely agree. Similar is brilliant, and I'm, I'm sharing also. I, I, I have the website www.dty.com, and I have w w i d. Well, so what if we trusted you? The, the other acronym I have both, and in the one. I want to point to the other one. So here's what if we trusted you, which is the book I need to write. Sorry for the distraction here. So here's what if we trusted you. We lost faith and trust in, we lost trust in humans, which anyway, uh, here we go. So this side's dark mirror, why we don't trust you. So these, these are meant to go back to back uh, in contrast. Um, Similar, my brain, there we go. Um, cool, where are we? Who would like to take us in a, in a different direction on this topic? I Ken. Would. So nearly 30 years ago, I went to, uh, there was something called Spring Hill, founded by Robbie Gass, which was an amazing um, place where there were, for every three percent, there, were, there was one um, qualified psychologist. And it was a totally experiential weekend based on Alexander Lowen's bioenergetic principles. Lots of catharsis. You know, we would, it was a, a weekend for the adult children of uh, alcoholic and abusive fathers. And I happen to fit into that category. And we sit across from someone um, on the floor and the instruction was, show me how you feel. Not tell me how you feel, show me. And um, it was quite an, uh, an amazing weekend. I, completely lost my voice. I screamed so much. I almost broke my wrist punching a punching bag. I, I got rid of a whole bunch of stuff. But there was a question there that was asked of what does it mean to be a man? And listening to 35 men stand up in front of the room and answer that question was revelatory. Um, probably 33 out of 35 at some point or other said, it means I'm not a woman, right? Men define themselves in opposition to women so frequently it is astonishing if you ask them. Uh, it came up about to be a man is not to be not to be weak, you know. All the traditional male macho bullshit, you're know, not to be weak, not to not you know to be able to be counted on, to be strong, to be able to handle adversity. And very, very few men there. And there were many gay men who had a lot of internalized homophobia. Very few men there actually were able to talk about being a man is to be loving, it's to be able to care, to create relationships. Um, so this has stuck with me over the years. Uh, you know, I've, I, I mentioned it, Jerry, in an email, I've been a veteran of four men's groups now in the last 30 years. And I love to pose this question, what does it mean to be a man? Because for men to answer that question is a deep exploration into their own psyche of how have I learned to be a man or what does it mean to me? And I'm happy to say that as I've gotten older and maybe I'm hanging out with a better class of people, I am finding men who are able to say, well, I'm a loving father, I'm a loving husband, I'm a loving son or spouse or, you know, whatever. Um, but still, it's, it's something that I think um, men really have a, a hard time with. It's, it, it's a very challenging question to answer. So I'll just throw it out here for whatever that's worth since we're doing a little bit of personal stories here around this. Thank you, Ken. I really appreciate that. Um, and I think there's a, there's a real, th this goes hand in hand with our beliefs about homo economicus and everything else. This, like a part of it is what do you do to men and women and what they think their role is so that they'll hold up the rest of the economic edifice, right? Um, and how, and then to me, the major religions contribute to this. I mean, we have these patriarchal um, religions uh, mostly that reinforce the economic 
models. Even though they appear to be very much of the so one of my amateur beliefs about, about what's happening, and I, some of you have probably heard this before, I, I borrow yin and yang from Taoism, with apologies to Taoism, and yin is generally receptive feminine dark earth energy, yang is generally bright outward masculine energy, and it does not mean that men are yang and women are yin, uh, the idea is that any entity to be healthy needs to have yin and yang in, in creative tension, that both need to be present, and that the interesting stuff kind of happens at that margin of contact. That's, that's really the, the, the place where, where juicy stuff happens. And then my, my own amateur theory is that somewhere between 300 and 3,000 years ago, yang won. And here I'm going to overload yang and say it's not just masculine outward, it's also paternalistic, hierarchical, command and control, analytic, separate, um, uh, you know, all of, all of those kind of attributes where yin is emergent, social, spiritual, emotional, connective, uh, all those kinds of things. And Yang won and said, all that yin stuff is heresy. You, sh you need to ignore it. If you ever bring it into conversation, you will be kicked out, you will be fired. And what I've seen happen in the last only 10, 15 years is that it's now okay to talk about meaning, purpose, love, mindfulness, and all that in the boardroom. Sustainability, all the softer things that were squished out of play um, are, are now legit, not everywhere, but they're at least legit topics to bring into these corporate conversations where the corporation had its like little emotional system like removed. You know, there was a, there was a morallectomy done as we designed the system that we live under. Um, and and it's, it's really interesting. So, so for me, when I look at religions and corporations and the economic system, to me, this young one thing happened long enough ago that even attempts to create a society where from each according to his capacity to each according to his need, you know, communism, we, we demonize communism partly because the communist experiments in China and Russia were horrifying, partly because they were young, wildly out of control, um, using some message about, hey, every, it's going to be good for everybody to actually grab the bottleneck of, of the pyramid of this hierarchy and run rampant over, you know, millions and millions of people. So um, how do we hit undo on this? Like, it, it, this is a huge thing because it, it, it's, it's, it, it's lasted so long and it's come back. And to me, the more we can honor Me Too and bring women into the conversation, bring people of color, indigenous populations into the conversation and reclaim, reclaim what we know together, what we knew together long ago, and then connect that to the new capacity to do things, really good things happen. So if you look on the, the schedule of uh, upcoming calls, I, I shared this um, last night on the, on the list. Basically, if you look at the spreadsheet, one of the next calls I want to do is, how do we mix the best of the old with the best of the new? That's kind of where I want to go with that. Um, but let me go to John and uh, on from there. With what you've just said there, Jerry, can we acknowledge that there is history. So if, if I look at the history of North America, for example, the railroads, the dams were built by men because it is physical, uh, challenging work that you need to be tough and strong to do that, not only to build the bridges, but also to protect your colleagues. But we're now moving into an economy of knowledge workers. Uh, something I look at is the future of work. So we've got automation, uh, machine intelligence coming down the line. We're not really prepared to adapt to that yet. But I can, I am positive about that, that that will enable an equalization of um, gender balance. That's what I'm looking for. So we can't do anything about the history. And I don't think it was deliberate. And I'm, I'm also keeping religion way out of this, this, this um, opinion. But... Um, you know, men had to be men and women had to be women in order to survive. So I'll, I, in, in I'll, a way, that's, that's, that's it's an old fashioned kind of uh, stereotype, but I hope it makes sense. So I just want to throw a little bit of question into the stereotype, because I think the idea that all the men went and hunted and all the women stayed home and 
you know, wove is, is broken. That doesn't work at all for me. <clears throat> and I think the modern spectrum of identity that we were just talking about existed way back then. And there were women who were strong and agile and really like the best shot in the, in, in the village. And they went on the hunt. And there was no problem with that. And, and I don't know where this happened. I have, I'm not an anthropologist. But I think that the idea that historically the men were the hunters and gatherers because they had to protect, like, no. Um, I think that it was mixed and probably tilted in the way that, you, that, that you're saying, you know, men, women, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and also care of children and all that. But, but really, everybody, if you go to an African village, everybody cares for the children, the men, the women, and it doesn't matter. If, like, if a, if a baby's hungry, it'll go up to another woman who's nursing other kids and, and, and like suckle for food. That, and that's a normal, normal thing in some parts of the world. Uh, that, that these things are just shared and move around. And then if you go to Aboriginal tribes, you will see that the women are, are insanely smart about where to find food and what to do and, and, and all of that. So, so these, things, these things were, I think they're all over the map. I do agree with the follow-on premise you're making, which is we're moving into knowledge work and other kinds of things where these gender issues about who's big and strong vanish and go away. But, but I, think that, I think we do ourselves a disservice by assuming that gender role assignments were very strong in the past just because men are bigger. I think that I, I, I don't buy that one. Does that make sense, John? Well, it is. It, no, it doesn't, to be honest. But I, I'm going to say I've got an open mind. But just to throw some examples of modern day, a fireman. So if a fireman's up a skyscraper on a ladder, he needs to carry out another man, 16 stone man. That man, ha you know, it's requisite variety. That man has got to be at least strong enough to lift that 16 year old man and take him down the ladder in order to save his life. Now, if it was a female and she wants to do that job and she's strong enough to do it, I've got no problem with that. But when we look at the, you know, the biology of men and women, if you do a huge survey, they are smaller, they're not as strong. So by putting a woman in that position, you're not only risking her life, you're risking the people that she's trying to save. So why do we have women firemen and women in combat now? What's up with that? How's that working? They're women firefighters, women? actually, not women firemen. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we have women on the front lines, you know, in Afghanistan or wherever, firing weapons, doing, doing everything the men are doing. And they've been through basic training and they need to figure out how to schlep the heavier guy at some point. But you've got to be clever at that point. Like, you use a sled, you strap things, you use leverage, pulleys. I don't know, you have to be cleverer when you're weaker. But I, but I think that, I don't know that, that, that this means there should be no women um, firefighters. Oh, I'm not saying that. I yeah. didn't say that. Um, but I mean, but there are, right? We're, 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 we've gone toward, toward, we don't have, we certainly don't have wage equality, but we've gone toward equality of access to a lot of things that we thought were formerly just men's domains. If you look at in the UK, I'm sure you've read this book, The Road to Wigan Pier. The Road to Wigan Pier? Yes. I'm not George sure. Orwell. I have not read it for sure. George Orwell. So he ah. looked at how the, the life of miners in the north of England, how, you know, I just, it would be a nightmare for me to be able to, to have to crawl through 12 inches space to hack out coal they used to put children down because children are supple small so you know there's, there's the argument for to say that a man's work is in the mines well actually no it was children yeah which is horrible to think about um so i've heard of the book and i've put it in because i read this book the intellectual we deserve which is a critique of jordan peterson um uh who's uh, the darling of the of the far right right now um, and it was written by Nathan Robinson, so I, I will share this link in a second. Um, but I have not read The Road to Wigan Pierce, so maybe I should put that on my reading list. And Judy, you have the floor. And can you, can you um, mute your video, please? And your audio is currently muted, so we actually can't hear you. I just reversed them. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Um, I had the thought when we were talking about the um, moral equity to me that was that you referenced in corporations that part of what happened 
I, from my view of the history of these things, is there have been dominant female cultures. It, the first were property owners in Egypt in ancient times. So this role of feminine, masculine dominance has altered dramatically history. And there's only a very small portion of it that's actually, in my mind, biological. But there's a lot of social structure about the normative behavior. And I think two landmark events in my mind were, first of all, access to pregnancy control came about over the last hundred years. And then the politically active standpoint that led to reformation, if you will, in a social context with suffragettes and voting. But the entry of women into various fields has been not coincidental with those events. Fields have emerged. When I was a student, there were very few women in the physical sciences, now approaching 50%, but the women are underrepresented in faculties. Um, so there are all these social movements that blend. And I think the individual meritocracy or the ability to be a whole person and express yourself as a whole person wherever you are in that continuum. And some of us, at least for me, I think our, our, our continuum isn't even a, a Gaussian distribution. There's some bipolarity to it. But I think that enablement of full spectrum of behavior, embracing of that as holistic in the yin yang is a really important one. And my perspective in the corporation, I saw a lot changed when the men in power hackers who were trying to move into organizations. For the first time, they saw the impact of the organization on a woman from a different perspective than they had seen it in the past. And it was a, a moment of enlightenment. And then they became advocates for a more open culture which I think led to some of the things you've identified. But it's just my notion is that there's a huge continuum and the yin yang, if you were to do a Gaussian, would overlap in zones and you have ranges of behavior. Um, I know some women I would not want to have a physical fight with. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's just, I think we have to be very careful about labels and start to try to enable full individual personal perspective from each individual to explore. And that's part of that trust issue, I think, is if you're worried about stepping out of lines, it's harder to be your own voice. I agree, and I, I think a big piece of this is how we deal with bad actors. Um, and, and I, I wanna sort of connect that into what should we do about these gender issues and Me Too and so forth is, is how do, how, well, just to go back to our topic, since we're near the end of our, our call time, how do men deal with men who are doing stuff they ought not be doing? Like, how do we intervene? But how do we intervene in, in some kind of a calm way, in some kind of a way that actually works? Or how do we intervene in a way that is startling enough that it provokes the person of focus to change their behavior or consider their behavior? I think that's important too, because, because, um, uh, this isn't about beating them until they're until they got some sense into them. This is about waking up that part of their brain that knows what's right. Um, so I, I love that quote, but trying to figure this out. I, I have us here on in my brain on matrilineal cultures because I'm extremely interested in who, what, where were matrilineal. And by the way, the the, the Haudenosaunee, uh, basically the entire northeast of the U.S., were matrilineal, and um, uh, when people say, well, how else would you distribute things in a, in a, in a culture? Well, uh, the, ex the, the surplus goes into a longhouse and the elder women of the tribe distribute it to the families that need food or you know, whatever the resource is that's being kept in common, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of things. But I'm really interested in what we can learn from, uh, from these kinds of cultures and assignments. And... When I say that Yang won and basically marginalized or demonized Yin, what I mean is that all these forms of living were basically wiped out. They were basically trampled over uh, worldwide. Uh, and the things that we assume are how society is run right now is what we were left with in some sense. 
Um, Doug, I'm really, I'm, just, I'm, I'm constantly curious about your environment because you're, you're surrounded by choice with a whole bunch of economists. And I'm assuming the majority of whom are men. I don't know how gender balance has changed over time in INET, but, but I think that, that uh, your, your role in changing the story of economics is super fascinating to me. And uh, I'd love to know what you, know, what, what you see. Well, I can't jump, push that into the last few minutes of the conversation. The first thing to say is that economists as a group are part of the movement away from humanity into mechanical systems. Uh, and that's a power trip. And the people who become economists do so because they want the class status of being associated with that. I'm being a little bit caricaturish here, but I think it's fairly correct. And that the, we would be better off in some ways if we never talked about economy and economists. Uh, but the good news about economy is its origin as a state management, which was a holistic concept for the Greeks, could be reestablished as the major task for humanity now is integrating humanity uh, with the globe, which is a state management on a bigger level. So that's the approach I've taken, not to throw out economy, but to restructure it. One problem is that if the graduate schools did that, uh, the graduates would have a hard time getting jobs. That's just the beginning. But since I have the floor for a moment, Please. I want to put in, I hear in the conversation a lot of stress on the psychology of trust, calm, and all that. But the psychology we actually have is adaptational to an institutional world uh, of capitalism, political power, and so on. So the question is, where's the leverage to try and make things better? I think that we are much better these days in talking about the psychology and the individual than we are about the institutional structures. Uh, what you're saying about ancient e Egypt and, and the Iroquois and things like that uh, get to the point that we need to really expand our institutional imagination because the institutions we have are the framework that people try to adapt to. And that's what's leading to so much psychological misery. Um, love that. Um, it's funny. Um, brief, sorry, I'm touching a link. Uh, copy, there we go. So, um, I, I, so what you said is where, where I'm looking really hard, which is the, the that, boundary, that interface between psychology and institutions and institutional design in particular, also the, the design of social norms and cultural norms. I think that's hugely important. And uh, I just put a link to a five minute university I, I did on a book called The Institutional Revolution, which is about the pre-modern British aristocracy who did all kinds of really weird things. But the author of the book explains how these very weird practices and norms were in fact a way of establishing trust at a distance at a time when nature could ruin anybody's plans, but you couldn't double check whether they were lying or whether they were, you know, they, they, it was real. <clears throat> and all these really weird institutions give us rule Britannia for 150 years. So, so very weird practices and you're like, what? And it turns out that, that this set of things they set up that were funky looking and smelling turn into the dominant uh, force, a little tiny island off the end of Europe dominates you know, world trade for quite a while. Um, and so that was very much about institutional design and psychology and culture all sort of jammed into something and then forced into a shape that held for a while until it didn't. And, and the aristocracy kind of lets go at the end. There's not a violent overthrow of the regime as there is in France. The aristocracy kind of lets go as other things show up. And now we have globalization right? Which brought some good. I've got a pretty inexpensive laptop that I'm talking to you all through, et cetera, et cetera. And yet brought a whole bunch of stresses and strains that we're not dealing with properly, partly connected to all of the mental models and scripts in our heads that we've been talking about here. And, and I, I'm really interested in those simple points of leverage. So how do we change the narrative? And, and I collect up, you know, there's six different uh, entities that have been trying to change the American dream. Right? So the American dream is 
everybody goes to college, everybody has a house with a white picket fence and a station wagon and a cocker spaniel. Uh, there's all these elements to, you know, and it, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, the, the rags to riches story. Well, the rags to riches story was invented for us. Like the rag, rags to riches story was, was intentional propaganda way back when. Um, and what you just said about the American dream is really good because notice there's no people in it. And, and so there's a bunch of entities trying to change the American dream. There's a bunch of entities trying to change how we measure success at the social level, like the Gini index, and at the corporate level, like triple bottom line, tomorrow's company. And there's a whole bunch of them. I can, I can, you know, on a different call, I can go through them in my brain, but I collect them all up because I'm praying that one or two of them really catch on and that we can shift how we measure success um, from the Dow Jones and uh, GDP. And which are horrible metrics, but are to this day, the ways we, we measure like if things are getting better or worse, right? So, um, so I think that this opens a path for lots of interesting conversation in the future. I think, I think we wandered pretty far from what can men do about me too. And I, I kind of apologize for that, but I love the conversation we have had. Um, I just wanna pass the mic to anybody who'd like it for some closing comments on this. And if you want to frame questions for upcoming IJB calls, uh, type them in the comments or tell me and I, you know, we'll set those up in the schedule. But uh, any thoughts? I, I, it turns out I would never have respected this 10 years ago, but I, I love institutional design and the emergence of cultural norms. Those two things seem to me to be much more important than we think they are. And I know nothing about policymaking. Actually, April, my wife, is better at it than, than me. She's better trained in it and has more exposure to it. But I find these things completely fascinating because architecture is destiny. And the people who've designed these architectures know that. Right? Any, uh, any closing? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean, architecture is destiny. <laughs> um, so when you've poured concrete someplace, people have to go down the road and obey the walls that you poured. And so metaphorically, if I pass laws that force you to do something or, or force you into a framework, um, you're going to have to use that framework. Uh, so for example, uh, Native American lands are now corporations. So in order to defend their rights, they were forced to use a structure that they don't like and that is not natural to Native American traditions or ways of thinking, but they need to be in corporations. And then each person has to be there's a blood quantum they have to meet for different tribes to be actually voting members of the tribe, uh, which causes all sorts of stupid things. I was just watching a couple, a couple of uh, conversations about this. Uh, there was a terrific conference uh, called uh, uh, Something Unsettled uh, last Friday, and April and I both watched the live stream all day. And one of the, one of the speakers was, uh, two of the speakers were Native Americans talking about this blood quantum thing. So, so if you can design the structure within which other people have to act, you can either constrain their behavior entirely or you can begin to change their minds or whatever else. So um, that's partly what I mean by architecture is destiny. Structure influences behavior until the behavior changes the structure. Yes, uh, and until you change the architecture. So I'm, I'm very interested in how we might change uh, that architecture. Let me, before we hang up, uh, I did a short video on our architecture is destiny. So let me put that video up here. I did a whole bunch of stuff around it. So let me share that video. Come on, little brain, catch up. There we go. Um, and let me put a link to that spot in my brain here as well. Um, yeah. Cool. So we can go into that some more in future calls. Any other closing thoughts? Yeah, because I, I, I have a problem with saying that it's destiny. It's, I don't mean it's. I don't mean it's destiny forever. Okay. I mean, I mean that we follow the architectures that we're given and that are poured for us until they break or are overthrown by somebody else's culture. Uh, Doug. Uh, along this line, there's a literary critic, Kenneth Burke, who talked about what he called the scene act ratio. The scene, when you're in the theater and the curtain opens, you can tell from the scene sort of the action that can be performed there. The scene contains the possible actions, which I think is getting at what you're saying about uh, architecture having a determining effect on us. Kenneth Burke is really worth reading.
He wrote a book I, called The Grammar of Motives. How about A Rhetoric of Motives? That came later. It's also good. Oh, so there's two different books. Yes. Fabulous. Thank you. I will find The Grammar of Motives, too. Brilliant. And I've not read any of his books. I just uh, found out about him and put him in my brain. Um, love that. Um, well, I'm going to click on that to launch my brain to it. I mean, my browser to it, stop the share and say, thank you very much. We will, uh, I will be inundated at a, at the CWA conference starting for all of next week. Uh, so probably there's not an IJB call until the week after until like April 16th, but I'll book one now so we can think about it and have some conversations. Please feel free to go into the spreadsheet and suggest topics and name them and whatever. Uh, and on the list, please um, just chat, talk on, talk on the IJB list. We have uh, three young members who are from India who were on our last call. They're from Delhi. Um, so I'd love to bring them into the conversations and engage them. So, um, what, what would you say? The IGB list? IJB list, the Inside Jerry's Brain uh, Google group. Oh, okay. Which okay. is how you found out about this call. Okay. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy. Bye-bye. Really appreciate this.